I'm Johan Maaskum, I'm teaching macroeconomics, sorry, I used to teach macroeconomics at the School of Business and Economics, I'm now an emeritus professor, but I'm still teaching by the way. Um, and I've been following the financial crisis since it started in 2007-2008 and have been talking about it very many times. And I love to talk about it because it's a fascinating subject, in particular for macroeconomics, and I'm teaching macroeconomics. <coughs> what I want to do is to give you a little bit of an overview of the issues which are involved in the uh, euro crisis, just as a start of the first lecture in this series of lectures, and my, <coughs> my colleagues will focus more on specific subjects. But I will also sp focus a little bit on specific subject, in particular the relation with economic growth. Um, what I intend to do is to talk for about one hour, then we have a break, and then we can have discussions and questions. If you have questions in the meantime, please ask them, and if they're difficult, I will say, well, I'll discuss it after the break. Yeah? Um, so what I want to do is to talk with you about the three crises in the euro crisis. The... Um, <coughs> Growth and competitive crisis, because I, that was the announcement of this lecture. I normally don't talk about it that much, but that's okay. Then about the sovereign debt crisis, the government debt crisis, and then about the banking crisis. I will talk very briefly about the banking crisis, by the way, because there are a lot of lectures about that. And these are all very interrelated. I have a very nice picture which shows the interrelations. But what is forgotten in that picture, and what is sometimes forgotten in all discussions, is that there's a very serious fourth problem uh, which is interrelated in every all these things, and this is the north-south problem in Europe, and I will also discuss that with you. So, if we look at the figure I found somewhere, but I like this figure because it summarizes very nicely, to a certain extent, the debate, and it also shows you the interrelations. Let's briefly go through this figure. So, what you see is, well, it started, by the way, with the banking crisis, the fall of Lehman Brothers, we all are aware of that, I guess, in 2008, September 2008. All banks go broke, and still two out of the four big banks in the Netherlands are nationalized. And the fifth bank is still in government debt. And the, four, the third bank is still in government debt. And the fourth bank is now getting weaker. So the banking crisis is still amongst us. Um, the banking crisis is important because if you have weak banks, if banks are in problems, they are reluctant to lend money to others. And then it becomes harder to borrow money for firms, for instance, and other, <coughs> other persons in the economy. And that can also have a negative impact on growth. On the other hand, if the economy is weak, what you see then is that the asset prices, which are on the balance of the bank will fall, will be lower because the economy is not booming. If the economy is booming, as, and as the prices go up, and if the economy goes down, as the price goes down. So the balance of sheet of the bank is under, under problems, and this is also a problem. So, so here you have a relationship between banking crisis and the growth and competitiveness. What you see is that a lot of banks hold sovereign debt. They hold money from the government, the government bonds, basically. So if the government bonds are under discussion, and we all know that this happened in the southern European countries in particular, in Greece, in Portugal, Spain, Ireland, Italy. So if that happens, then the banks all of a sudden are also in problems because they have a lot of bonds, bonds on their balance sheets. So that's a very important problem for them. On the other hand, <coughs> if there's a bank failure, if the bank can no longer be uh, viable, then the government almost has to support it, as we have seen in the Netherlands. Two out of the four banks are nationalized. And the third one was heavily intervened, by the way. And that costs a lot of money. So that is, again, a problem for the government debt. So here you have, again, also a relationship. And obviously, if debt is considered as a problem, then you want to have austerity measures. You want to reduce your government expenditures, and, um, and that is, of course, 
hampering economic growth because you are putting the brake on economic growth essentially. So that's, that's, that's what's here happening. On the other hand, if the growth is low, then income growth is low and your debt is becoming more and more a burden. So here you also have an interrelationship. So all these things are highly interrelated. We should be aware of that. So if we pick out one of these problems, we should always keep in the back of our minds that they are related somehow to the other problems. Having said that, I would like to um, start with the growth performance in the euro area because for some reason this was the topic I was supposed to talk about. I never talked about it, so this is my first time. Um, but I liked it because look at this picture. Isn't this a beautiful picture? 1960, here I studied economics by the way, and the US economy growth and the European economy growth. If you look at this picture, what you see is that the European economy and the US economy are more or less growing hand in hand till the mid-90s, till say 93, something like that. Yeah? And then all of a sudden there starts a divergence and what you see is that basically the European economy stagnates. So it stagnates at a level, four times its initial level, whereas the US economy goes through to five times its initial level. And that's fascinating, because why would that be the case? And my contention, but I'm not saying that everybody agrees with that. A lot of things I would say is not, not necessarily agreed by everybody, by the way. Uh, but that's uh, for your own mind to make up. <coughs> my contention is that part of that story has to do with the fact that uh, Europe has been performing badly in terms of um, aggregate demand and austerity measures. And I will explain it more closely. So what you see here, Basically, is that the, uh, there's a strong divergence, sorry, there's a strong divergence after 93, yeah? And if we look carefully, I found this figure, and I like that, what you see here is the U.S. growth. And you have to look at the, um, at the uh, well, you don't see it very well, but these are the light blue, the light blue bars. And what you see is that a lot of the growth, this is basically my point, is demand-driven. So if aggregate demand increases, aggregate demand is consumption, investment, and government expenditures. If that increases, then the economy increases. And if aggregate demand goes down, like in the crisis uh, in 2008, then the economy goes down very strongly. In the red line is GDP growth, and the three bars. So this is the, uh, this is the um, foreign balance, the current account, you can say, the current account balance. The current account is, roughly speaking, export minus import. So the US has been importing much more than it has been exporting from China a lot. And you will hear that next week from Bart Verspach in large detail. So the US has been exporting much more than it has been importing. And, um, and what you see here, and this is the point I want to make, is that demand is always playing a very important role in the growth of the US economy. Yeah, whether consumption growth, investment growth, and government expenditures are growing or not. You may think, well, of course. But look at Europe. This is Europe. You see that Europe has a totally different picture. What you see here is that only the dark blue bars, the current accounts, which is exports essentially, are driving European growth. So the European growth is not demand driven in the sense of domestic demand driven in the sense of uh, consumption, um, in, uh, consumption in investment, but it's more, mostly driven, if positive, by exports. Europe is exporting more than it's importing. So that's a totally different picture from the US. And as you can also see, well, if you look at it carefully, these are growth rates around 4%, 2 to 4%, roughly speaking. And these are growth rates at maximum 3, and here they are even negative. So what you see here is that we, Europe has, let me say, we, we have a double dip, as it's called, because we had a dip. In, um, after the Lehman Brothers in 2008, after 2008, negative growth, and we have again negative growth for four quarters, at least the recession in uh, 2012. So this is called a double dip. If you look at the US, <coughs> sorry, if you look at the US, you see that they had also this dip in 2008, a little bit small, and here only one quarter negative growth and only positive growth afterwards. So the US definitely did not have this double dip. The US had a much better growth performance. And I think 
that the increased aggregate, the, the stimulus of the economy by aggregate demand, by government also, has a lot to do with that. In Europe, um, as I said already, it's in particular exports which play an important role, uh, in particular after the, after the uh, crisis in 2008. And you can see, remember this, that Europe stagnates essentially. Yeah? So to the extent that we are able to keep our economy going, it's because of exports. And the other things are almost negative. This is the government kicking in, because the government is putting all the brakes on. Well, this will be my message, which I only will repeat about 50 times this lecture. Um, so exports are definitely dominating the imports in Europe. Prior to the Lehman Brothers, it was more or less equal, by the way, but after the Lehman Brothers, what you see is basically because the economy is going down, imports are going down, so income, imports are not increasing that much anymore. Exports are simply going on. And as a consequence, you see that the trade balance, which is export minus imports, is becoming more and more positive. I will come back to that later also. This is what's happening in Europe. And you can also see that this implies, for instance, that the unemployment in Europe is increasing, whereas in the US and the UK and in Japan, it either is stable or decreasing. So Europe also has to do with this increasing unemployment problem because of this double dip, essentially, and this negative growth. Yeah, that's message one. Um, so what I'm arguing is that the uh, growth performance in the performance in your area is till the mid-90s parallel with the US. And then as it diverges strongly because in the US growth was demand-driven, consumption, investment, and government spending, because mon both monetary and fiscal policy were expansionary. Both the Federal Reserve Bank and the government helped to stimulate the economy. Whereas in Europe, what you see there is that if we had growth, it was only export driven. It was not definitely not because demand was stimulated from domestic factors. And this has to do with the uh, austerity. The government should not spend reckless. That was typically the European mantra. And the monetary policy has to keep the economy going. And I will, I will show that because that's very important to realize. And I'm not sure that my colleagues from finance, because you will have all these finance guys talking uh, later, but they will, will, well, they will stress this as much as I do. What you should realize, basically, is that we had a very expansionary monetary policy, <coughs> both in the US, well, in all countries, both in the US and UK, and so on, and so on, and so on. What you should realize, that monetary policy is what central banks do. And if the economy goes back, goes bad, till the uh, Till the Lehman Brothers, the banks lower the interest rates and the economy trends, tends to be overheating. The central bank increases the interest rates. That was basically what central banks were doing all the time. Yeah? So, um, so let's see what happened. Here we are in 2004. This was the Greenspan put. I will not talk about that too much. But then the economy tended to be overheating. This was after the dot-com crisis. Greenspan lowered the interest rates like crazy after the dot-com crisis. The American economy started to grow again, and hup, the interest rates went up. And in Europe also a little bit, and UK they were already relatively high. And then the Lima Brothers fall. And automatically, we have a crisis in dramatic time. And as a consequence, central banks start to lower the interest rate. Because if the economy goes back, you should lower the interest rate. But what's the problem? economy kept on going bad. So what should the central banks do? Lower the interest rate. But what was the problem? It was already zero. The interest rate is half percent or zero. So you cannot lower it. Wow, what the hell should we do? Well, we had a very good thing. The last president of the central bank of the Federal Reserve Bank was Bernanke. And Bernanke was a professor of macroeconomics. And what was his specialization? The economic crisis in the 30s. And what had he learned from the economic crisis in the 30s? Flood the economy with money. <coughs> Otherwise, things go bad. So Bernanke immediately realized that there was a big danger of deflation, essentially. Prices would go down. Maybe we should have a footnote here. This is just a footnote. Inflation is when prices are increasing too much, yeah? and we were afraid of that at some time. Maybe you don't remember that, maybe you don't. Deflation is when prices go down. 
And we all know that central banks are afraid for inflation. They want to contain inflation. But what we also should know <coughs> is that central banks are even more afraid of deflation. Why should central banks, why are central banks afraid for deflation? Because then your economy enters a negative cycle, a yeah. way to buy, so you have a lower consumption and you have even more deflation. Exactly, deflation has a very strong tendency to enforce itself because if the prices go down, you say, well, this laptop will be cheaper tomorrow. I will buy it tomorrow. But the prices are going down, so you start to postpone your consumption expenditures, etc. So you come in a negative spiral. And the central banks cannot afford to have the negative spiral. So central banks are very much afraid of deflation. And of course, if you cannot lower the interest rate, then you should do something else to, <coughs> to stimulate the economy. And this is what the central banks had to do pretty fast already, because you see that at the end of 2008, the interest rate apparatus was almost exhausted. So, and the Federal Reserve Bank had to intervene very strongly. And this is what they did in 2008. So normally the money growth, the money stock was about uh, 0.8 trillion dollars. And what you see is that they tripled it. You see this also, but you see that, imagine this. They tripled the amount of money in the economy. Three times as big as it usually is. So they flooded the economy with money, basically. This is what Bernanke did. And did it help? Nope. So what did Bernanke do? He flooded again. Quantitative easing started to enter the picture. Here, quantitative easing. Maybe you have heard about that. Yeah? Well, quantitative easing is just another word for printing money. But all the textbooks say, thou shalt not print money. So we say quantitative easing, yeah? That sounds totally different. <laughs> but it is printing money, yeah? So Bernanke started to print money pretty strongly. But not strong enough, as you see. So quantitative easing too entered the steam. And he started to print more money, because he learned from his experience and his research of the Great Depression, you should print money until the economy starts going. Because he was very afraid <laughs> for inflation. And this helped. It was a very serious jump, but still did not work enough. And as a consequence, here in the end of 2012, he announced that, if I remember on top of my head correctly, he would buy each month 80 billion uh, US uh, dollars treasury each month till the economy would be, get going. And this was what was called quantitative easing uh, three. And this really got the economy going. And now they start tapering it. You maybe have heard about it in the newspapers, which means that they are starting to reduce the program a little bit. As a footnote to this, yes, I'm out of my original footnote. As a footnote to this, there's a new president, Janet Yellen, the first president of the first female president of the <coughs> of the central bank in the United States. And but she's also a very clever professor in economics, of course. And um, she's married to a Nobel Prize winner, George Akerlof, so is even better, and um, and she she where Bernanke already announced it, and she started to 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 bring down the, the monthly uh, buying of the uh, treasury as well as by the Federal Reserve. But what you see is, and this is the point I want to make because these finance guys will talk about it in much more detail. What you see is that the reaction of the central banks, because you could no longer lower the interest rate, was to flood the economy with money. And the same happened, of course. In the euro, <coughs> in the euro area, here again we had we were around forty thousand, but euro is always a little bit more modest. I mean, we have all these Germans breathing in our necks, etc. So we have to be careful, and so we we kind of went from thirteen hundred to well almost doubled, not exactly doubled our money stock, also overnight in a very short period. That means not overnight, but in a very short period to get the economy going again. And then, again, in 2012, we realized it was not enough. And uh, Trichet started with this uh, LTRO, this, uh, I forgot what it stands for, these long-term uh, whatever operations and uh, refinancing operations. And um, then we got the outright monetary transactions by Draghi. I can talk about that in more detail if you want to, but that's not very relevant for us to it's not how you how how to have it technically. What is important is that we start that we should realize is that also the European Central Bank increased its money stock almost three times because in order to save the economy. 
And what you should realize, I can talk about this for an hour easily, is that the central bank essentially did everything which was forbidden by textbooks, which was forbidden by the law or whatever. And they were brought to the law. They were brought to the German court, actually, in Karlsruhe. I will not talk about that. But so they did everything which was forbidden. And why did they do this? Partly because the fiscal policy did not cooperate enough. Partly because the fiscal policy let them down. The European leaders were bickering and discussing. And in America, the Republicans and the Democrats were fighting over deficit policies, etc. So one of the reasons the central banks had to take all these totally unconventional measures was because the fiscal policy did not uh, <coughs> adapt them enough. Uh, um, I will come back to that later. So what you see is that the inflation, this is important, the, uh, <coughs> the inflation in your area, also in the US, by the way, which indeed threatened to get deflation, yet there was, this was a serious concern, that, that went back. And the core inflation rate, which is the underlying inflation rate, went upward again. And this is very important. What you also should realize is now, what you see is that the central bank is, is uh, because of all the heavy critique also, is starting to reduce the money stock again. Yeah, well, they are still, by the way, at the level of two times the pre-crisis level. So it's still an enormous amount of money which is floating around. But they are starting to reduce the money stock again. And there's a lot of discussion in the, in the financial circles. And maybe my colleagues will talk about that, whether this is not uh, creating, again, a deflationary tendency. And there's a lot of discussion whether the central bank should not again get more aggressive with its monetary policy. But OK, monetary policy is not what I really wanted to talk about, although we should not forget that it's very important. Um, I talked about monetary policy for two reasons, by the way. Uh, I only focused here basically on, on, the on, the, on stimulating the economy. Yeah? by lowering the interest rate and uh, by injecting money in the economy, because they essentially feared the liquidity trap. But there was also a reason for the central banks to do all these things, and that's because they, did not, they could not afford that the banks would go broke. So they had to keep all the banks going. And the banks um, were in serious trouble. Um, and this is what my colleagues in finance will discuss I guess much more in detail, but what we should realize is that banks are highly interrelated. So if one bank goes down, all the banks go down. This is a domino uh, effect, basically. So they had to keep the system going, and that means that they, in a way they had to pamper the banks. And this is one of the reasons they did a lot, also provided easy access to money to keep the banks afloat. And <coughs> this is a problem also because these banks definitely do all, de all deserve to be afloat. But that's the problem. And the third thing, I will come back to that later, is that they had to save the uh, Euro, st <coughs> the uh, states of the European Union. Um, maybe I should talk about that a little bit. Because that has to do with the sovereign debt. Yeah, the European countries like Greece and Ireland and Portugal, well, basically, they threatened to go broke. And essentially, Greece went broke, as we all know. Yeah, Greek, when you had the Greek bonds, as a, as, a, as, a private, uh, as a private person, you would not get all the money back which, you, which Greek owes you. So, so the Greece essentially went broke. Um, and, and, um, and this appeared from the following. I will show you this figure. Because these are the interest rates for these various countries. Yeah, so this is, of course, uh, Germany, uh, relatively average. Germany is doing well. The Netherlands is doing well. And all the usual suspects are doing very bad. Yeah? And these are the normal interest rates we're talking about. But the blue line, which is the Greek, also the Greek flag, is the left-hand scale. So the Greek interest rate at some stage was 40%. Well, of course it went broke. I mean, imagine that you have a serious debt of about, let's say, 100% of your GDP. And you have to pay 40% interest, which means that you have to pay 40% of, of your GDP each year in interest. Well, then it's inevitably that you go broke. Yeah? So of course Greece went broke. And of course the ECB could not, and Europe could not afford that this happened. And therefore the, inter the ECB had to intervene. And how did the ECB intervene? How would you imagine you were a trichet, because this was still in the trichet. Greece is going broke, and you want to do something about it. What do you do as trichet, being trichet? Well, you can buy the bond, but you're not 
Exactly. This is what he did. Yeah. And um, so you start to buy Greeks bonds in order to drive the price of the bonds up and the interest rate down, essentially. And what you see is that this was already successful. And then uh, Trichet, who was a Frenchman, he was already suspect. He was followed up by Draghi. And Draghi's Italian. Under Berlusconi, imagine this, what happened. So Draghi was all of a sudden president. And we had already this European president who was buying up bonds from selected countries. And then we got an Italian uh, president for the ECB. Well, he could not afford to buy up bonds. No way. So he scrapped the program of, of, of Trichet just as a signal <coughs> to, uh, to appease certain countries. And um, he went over to another mode of operation. But it didn't really help. And then, Trichet, and then Draghi said, forget it, mate. I will buy every bond which is necessary to save a country. And this was such a signal to the market that he never had to do it till now. But this is what he announced. So these banks were forced to do whatever they did for various reasons. The, the, the central bank was forced to do it to stimulate the economy, to prevent the default of banks, and to, to, uh, <coughs> to prevent the defaults of EU states. Yeah? It's very important that you realize these elements. And the reason, as I said already, was also <coughs> because the fiscal policy was basically letting them, letting them down. Oh, I could not resist the temptation to have a sheet where I explain this more carefully. OK. Um, <laughs> well, what you should realize is that the state of the economy around the Lehman crisis was such that fiscal policy was suspect. It was only the automatic pilot, and the, and the government policy should not interfere, and only monetary policy should be uh, should set the interest rates, basically. But then they didn't think of the liquidity trap, which means that the interest rate is actually zero, and you have a serious problem. So, the, so this forced the central banks basically to re, to to resort to very unconventional policies, and um, the Fed did this with its quantitative easing two and three. Uh, the ECB with its long-time refinancing operations and its outright monetary transactions, etc., and uh, they did everything which was forbidden, essentially. <laughs> what they also did, of well, course, finance will tell you, but they also, if a private bank borrows money from the central bank, it has to provide a collateral, yeah, and the collateral is something you give in order to be able to borrow something, and. Um, Of course, these collaterals have to be triple A when you talk about the central bank. But all these banks had a lot of rubbish on their balance sheets, and they had to get rid of this rubbish. So the central bank, the Fed, and the ECB said, well, that's green bonds, OK. Give them to me, and you'll get the money. So, so they, they accepted also a lot of collateral, for instance, for very shady, shady debts, basically, in order to save the banks. Um, and the fiscal policy was just focusing on the zero deficit and, and keeping the keeping the keeping the expenditures in base, etc. And well, personally, I think this is basically a for Elon's policy. I will come back to that. I hope to enforce structural changes, but it's not really clear what the structural changes should be then. And this is another element we could discuss after the break. Um, fiscal policy. Well, we have of course our famous Maastricht norms of which. Maastricht is very proud in the Maastricht Treaty in 1992, and we agreed there to have a 3% deficit <coughs> at maximum, which later on was, by the way, more or less said it should be actually 0% on average, and the government debt below uh, 60%. Yeah? And with this, in our pocket, we entered the crisis. Well, look what happened. This is what happened in the US. The crisis comes. This is the deficit. They have already a larger deficit, of course. Um, this was George Bush, by the way. Uh, <coughs> well, George Bush, he ended the war in Iraq. He lowered taxes, and he was surprised they had the deficit. OK. And so Obama inherited this. And then, um, of course, the deficit increased enormously. And they are starting to reduce it, but what you should realize is that the deficit is still around 5 6%. Look at the UK. 
Look at Japan. But Japan is a, is a very different story because they are really in deep trouble because they had deflation for about a decade or two decades. So they are really in, in deep trouble. And this is what we call economics, uh, basically. And uh, Japan also. So all these large countries have huge deficits. And look at Europe. We cannot have a deficit because we have the Maastricht norms. OK. Look at the, uh, at the government debt as a ratio for GDP. Again, this is in the period 2000-2007. Well, actually, not in 2007, but OK. Uh, this is in 2008, 2010, 12, and 2013. What you see is the blue line is Europe. We, were, we had a relatively higher deficit initially compared to the other countries. Uh, this is uh, the UK, the red line, and the green bar is Japan. But what you see is that already pretty fast, the US and the UK were much more aggressive in their policies, started to stimulate the economy much more, and as a consequence, of course, had a higher debt. But OK, so be it. Japan is a different story, because I have a star with Japan. Do you know what a star stands for? It should be double. No, this is the total debt. So this is the, the Japanese debt should be not 120, 240%, but then my figure would go crazy. So, so this is why I said uh, the star, yeah? So Japan started the story with a debt of already 160%, but still, relatively strong economy is a funny thing. So debt is definitely not everything. This is the, one of the messages you should get from that, of course. Yeah, of course, debt is not an important, but it's definitely not everything. So all these, so what you see is that the European debt did not increase definitely not as fast as the US debt. <coughs> and this is one of the factors why our growth stagnates. This is what I wanted to maintain. And this was because of our interest in norms. I also could not resist the temptation to show the Netherlands and Germany in this story. <laughs> and what you see is that the Netherlands is, well, in Dutch you say it, Braaf, the image from the class, the, 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 the best guy from the class. Because we have the lowest debt, essentially, also compared to Germany, and definitely compared to the EU average. And we're all complaining about the debt problems, etc. And um, well, what we should realize is that debt is always relative to growth. Debt is always relative to growth. And if your debt <coughs> is increasing relative to your growth, you have a serious, to your GDP, you have a problem. But this can have two reasons. One is that your debt is going up, but it's going up faster than your GDP. And to bring the debt to GDP ratio down, you can do two things. Either you bring your debt down, or you bring your GDP up. So you stimulate growth. And if you stimulate growth, then you also bring your debt to GDP ratio down. And that's the part of the story which usually is forgotten in these discussions. And we should think about that much more carefully, because uh, that's happening uh, in other countries also. Um, so why did all these deficits, uh, here you see all these increasing deficits, why did they increase? Well, we should realize there are three reasons for that. <coughs> the most easy reason to explain is that all these governments had to bail out banks. Banks went broke, and we had to pay for them. The taxpayer had to pay for them. Which means that your debt increases, your government debt increases, because the government had to pay for it. Yeah? And on average, at least 5% of GDP has been paid out for banks. So at least 5% of the increase, maybe more, depends on the country also, is, is paid for bailing out banks, essentially, and goes to the shareholders of the banks, essentially. So that's one element which you should realize very carefully. The second point is this automatic stabilizer. If the economy goes back, sorry, if the economy goes back, if the economy goes down, what you see is that on the one hand, government expenditures go up because people need more social, social assistance, etc. And on the other hand, taxes go down because, well, the economy is going down. As a consequence, the gap between expenditures and taxes increases, hence the deficit increases. So if the, and this is a normal breathing of the economy, then this is why we call it the automatic stabilizer, because nobody has to do anything, no laws have to change, no conscious actions have to be taken. If the economy goes down, the deficit goes up, which implicitly means that the economy will be stimulated. And if the economy goes up, the deficit goes down, which implicitly implies that the economy will be 
<coughs> destimulated a little bit, which is good in that situation. And this is also what you see. Look here at Germany, for instance. Uh, well, this is a specific point about the unification. But normally, when the economy goes down, the deficit goes down. <coughs> and when the economy goes up, the deficit. Uh, the, sorry, when the economy goes down, the deficit becomes larger. And when the economy goes up, the deficit becomes smaller. Yeah, so that's normally for an economy. You also see it in France very clearly. GDP growth and the deficit, yeah? So the deficit normally breathes with the economy. But you should realize that if you then impose a, a, a norm of 3%, then all of a sudden the stabilizer can be constrained. And that can be difficult, basically, for the economy. So that's one problem which is imposed by these master's norms that the automatic stabilizer cannot necessarily do its work properly. The other thing is what I said, and this is the most complicated element of my story. I cannot even explain it to my wife. I tried several times. <laughs> um, but I can't explain it to students in economics. Um, <clears throat> what you should realize is that in the economy you have several segments. One is the government. Yeah? And this can be imbalanced, in the sense that the government can spend more than it gets. Yeah? On the other hand, you also have the uh, households and firms. And they save and invest. And there can be a gap between savings and investments. Yeah? Let me write it down. Um, so the government. Expenditures <coughs> minus taxes which is the deficit, yeah? Or surplus, but we don't have that often surplus. Um, the, 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 the households and firms, they save and they invest, yeah? <clears throat> so this is excess savings or excess investment. What does the Netherlands have? Excess savings or excess investment, do you think? <coughs> what does Germany have? Come on, these are all Protestant countries. <laughs> They're saving like crazy. They all have excess savings, yeah? So these are pretty large, <coughs> both in the Netherlands and in Germany. Now, the Netherlands is a little bit of a problem because of the mortgage problem, but let's not talk about that. Um, but basically, we are ex ex excess savers, yeah? So we are, holding, we are having money around, basically. The government is doing things. And the third thing, we have to close this, of course, because the money has to get somewhere, yeah? And where it has to go is abroad, so the foreign sector, which is a nice word for abroad. Where we have exports minus imports. <coughs> yeah? These are the three elements which you should look at in an economy. And of course, together, they should be closing. So if you spend more <coughs> than you tax, and if you uh, invest more than you save, then you have to import more than you export, basically. That's, <coughs> for instance, what the US is doing. So um, what you should realize is that the economy overall has to be in balance. And these are communicating vessels in a way. Yeah? These are three elements which you should not ignore. The firms and households, you can disaggregate them. The firms and households, the government, and the foreign sector. Well, if you then, all of a sudden, say one of these things would be zero, then implicitly you are saying that these, three, these two should be balancing automatically. very strange. Because, for instance, in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, we are exporting 10% more of our GDP than we're importing. Germany is about 6% more of a GDP exported than it's importing. So then implicitly what you're assuming somehow is that the savings and investments are in that balance. Well, it's not necessarily automatically true. So what I wanted to say is essentially that because of all the decisions made in households and in foreign sectors, the government has to 
go with the flow and accept that there's a deficit or a surplus, depending on the situation. And this is my third point, that, <coughs> that the government balance should never be seen in isolation, but always in relation to exports minus imports and savings minus investments, basically. And so, simply imposing that there should be a zero deficit, well, then why shouldn't you impose that exports should equal to imports? Why would you allow exports to be more than imports systematically? I'll come back to that later, by the way, but think for one minute. I will be silent for, no, not for one minute, that's too long. But please reflect for one very short period. <laughs> if a country is exporting consistently every year more than it's importing, what's happening? Yeah? I'll come back to that in a minute. But that's very strange. And this is what the Netherlands has been doing for, well, at least as long as I've studied economics. So, for 50 years, I think. And, um, no, not 50, but anyhow. So, so these are very strange things. And then you cannot never say that the government budget should be zero. This is about my whole point, essentially. The government has to breathe with the other sectors and has to accept that the other sectors also are not in balance. So, <coughs> these, 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 these master numbers turned out to be far too restrictive. Uh, you should not have the automatic stabilizer. You should look at your excess savings and the current account. And <coughs> you, <coughs> you should not focus that much only on government finance. You should also focus on growth to solve your debt problem. And inflation, by the way, that inflation is again something in the textbooks, which is not allowed. But the US has frequently inflated her debt away. So we should be aware of the fact that these things happen. OK. So I've been talking about all these relations implicitly. And I hope they become a little bit clearer about the banking crisis, the growth of that different crisis, and the sovereign debt crisis, and how all these things are related. Yeah, you can reflect upon it again. But as I said already, these are very serious constituents of the euro crisis. But there's a third element which we should also um, accept, and this is the uh, north and south problem. <coughs> <coughs> and I want to talk for 10 minutes about the north south problem, if that's okay with you, also if it's not one. Well. And, um, and, and then I will round off and we can have a break and afterwards discussion. Yeah, so I want to focus on the north south problem for a while because this is quite important and not always recognized as explicitly as it should be. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the current account problems between the North and the South. What I'm going to argue is that there was a co competitive wage uh, devaluation of the North. The Netherlands, Germany, we have kept our wages systematically low and as a consequence became even more competitive. As a consequence, we have an enormous current account surplus. We are exporting a lot to the South, the Netherlands and Germany. And the, the productivity differentials are, are tremendous. That's a serious problem, by the way. In the South, well, what you should realize is the following. Um, well, I have a separate lecture on that, but just in a nutshell. Imagine this. You are one of the usual, usual suspects. You enter the European Union, the euro area. You get the euro. Yeah? you're used to an interest rate of, let's say, 16%, which is normal in your country. And all of a sudden, what does the interest rate become? 4%, 3%. So what do you do? Wow. Spent, spent, spent. So all these southern countries, all of a sudden, because they entered the euro area, got an incredibly low interest rate, according to their standards, which is based on the sole fact that they entered the euro and got one currency and no longer could depreciate or appreciate against the other currency because the, the exchange rate was one by law. Yeah? So they started to spend like crazy, of course, because it was very easy for them to borrow. Wow, this is a Valhalla. And this is what happened, essentially. So you got enormous overconsumption and housing, housing booms in Spain, uh, Ireland, um, 
and you got an enormous current account deficit because all these countries start to import. They wanted to consume. Well, why did they get consumption goods from Germany, from the Netherlands, etc.? Yeah. So this is what started to happen. And um, well, let me show you that first. Uh, this this is what I want to show first. This is what happened essentially. So what you see is we start to enter the euro area here in 2002. And as a consequence, you see the blue line is the imports from the periphery, essentially, relative to the exports. They got current account deficits, which were, which, which were very huge. And in Northern Europe, you got current account surpluses, including Germany, the, the big one, which were very huge. Yeah? So this was totally out of balance. And this happened, and this is what I skipped. If I want to so what happened essentially was that um, that all these countries were growing relatively in line with each other till till um, <coughs> till basically till the crisis, and then all of a sudden the crisis started, and they started to falter. Of course, Germany uh, uh, goes on a little bit. Spain stagnates and even goes down a little bit. Greece. Is, 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 is falling strongly. Portugal was already struggling to keep up. And these countries could not support what they were doing initially. Initially, they were growing nicely, nicely as you see. And the unemployment, well, this, this, this increased tremendously, but that's what we all know. Because the productivity growth in these countries was much lower, basically. The productivity is well. What you can produce with your labor force, essentially. And th uh, this is the Netherlands. We have a very high productivity growth. Uh, Germany is the red line. This is the European average. And Italy is lower, and Spain is definitely lower. Yeah, so, so what you see is that the usual, usual suspects, they have a low productivity growth compared to the northern countries, uh, which is not that surprising. And, and that's one of the problems, which is, which is pretty serious, in particular if wage growth is not necessarily in line with that. And this was not in line with that. So what you see is that the price developments, because I think for one minute, well, that's, <laughs> if you have a relatively low productivity, if you have a relatively low productivity growth compared to your competitors, what will happen to your price? That will increase, yeah. So what did you see here? Inflation. These are the usual suspects. And this is Austria, Germany, Finland, for the Netherlands, not exactly, but so what you see is that the high productive countries have very modest price increases, and the usual suspects, well, they had huge inflation. Yeah? <clears throat> Which is basically my point, and also made them not compet less competitive, of course, r related to imports and exports again. So there's a huge competition problem between the uh, <coughs> between the user suspects, here the real appreciation would be 30%, and Germany minus 22%, for instance. Um, and this caused all these current account balance problems. <coughs> and now we come back to what does this imply? And this is why I asked you already to think earlier for a minute, because the North, Germany, and the Netherlands, we have had surpluses for ages. Decades, essentially. And what happens if you are a country which consistently has a current account surplus against a country which consistently has a current account deficit? What does that mean? <coughs> it means that the country with the deficit has to borrow money from the country with the surplus in order to be able to import or import. Yeah? So China is lending money to the US enormously every year. And the US is importing from China every year. And the US is paying this with government bonds, which is funny, but OK. Um, so this is what is happening. So if you import consistently relatively more than you export, you are borrowing more and more. And if you export more and more than you import, you are lending more and more. Yeah? So you get enormous imbalances in lending and borrowing between these countries. And that can create tensions, to put it very mildly. 
So these are accumulated <coughs> um, borrowings and lendings the net foreign position. Germany <coughs> has outstanding <coughs> almost well, more than 900 billion euros. And Spain <laughs> and Italy. Okay, so <laughs> this creates, of course, enormous tensions. And this cannot be solved overnight. Yeah? So this is an underlying problem which we all should recognize. And something has to be done about it. But it's very easy, it's very hard to solve this because Germany keeps exporting more and more. And for these other countries, it's very hard to stop importing more and more. Yeah? So, so it's a very serious problem. This was caused, as I said already, partly by the productivity, productivity differentials. And that's a serious problem because, well, I'm not an expert in this area, but the southern countries are less productive than the northern countries. And somehow we have to do something about that because if we don't solve that problem, then we can never become competitive, yeah? Unless they reduce their wages to far too low levels, essentially. So, and also what you see is that to make things harder, not only is the north, north, north more productive, but we also start to lower our wages, essentially. Germany, with all these hard four reforms, the Netherlands already earlier in, with our labor market reforms in the 80s, etc. We all have lowered our wages very competitively, essentially. And the wage share in national income has been decreasing in these countries. So that makes it even harder for the other countries to catch up. Yeah? And this is one of the reasons that, for instance, the IMF and the OECD at some stage, they have no longer said it, but at some stage they actually advocated that Germany should increase its wages to solve these problems. And um, OK. So this is, this is a problem in the north-south north problem within Europe. I was talking about the European problem more in general before that. But within Europe, we have a serious time bomb ticking, essentially, which is the north-south problem. And this definitely also needs a solution. So the problems are that we have gross imbalances between the north and south. We have a very vulnerable financial sector. The banking sector is very, uh, a very serious struggle. What I didn't talk about, but what I should mention here, and we can discuss it after the break if you want to, is that um, the US has been much more aggressive in reforming the banking sector than Europe has. In Europe, we have done nothing about our banks. Our banks are still, well, being what they are, and nationalized or whatever. And uh, we didn't see any banker go to jail here in Europe. In the US, various bankers have gone to jail. And the biggest fine for banks in the Netherlands was imposed by the US. So the US regulations are much more strong. And the US made a much, much better point of reform in the banking sector. Also not enough, but at least better than Europe. And Europe is doing very bad at reforming the banking sector. But again, this is for my colleagues of finance to, to explain that to you. But <clears throat> so that, we have a very vulnerable financial sector. And that's a serious problem. We have far too low growth. And this is also a very serious problem for various reasons. One of the reasons is that our debt also becomes more and more problematic if we have such a lower growth. And if we would have a higher growth, our debt to GDP ratio would automatically increase stronger. Um, our fiscal policy, while well, we have a capitalistic zeal for austerity, which is unprecedented. The other countries don't have this, thank the Lord. So they keep us a little bit afloat. Because to whom are we exporting? To all these countries which are investing by their governments. We should realize that. Yeah? Um, and the solutions, well, they should be that we have, should have much more fiscal coordination. That's coming, by the way. Yeah? We are having much more fiscal coordination, but also solidarity. That's a little bit more problematic. And also get rid of this zeal for austerity. We should have a very strong banking system. Uh, in the European Bank, we should have a strong supervision. That's a problem, I think, to get that. And we should stimulate sustainable growth. I think that's it. Oh. Well, this is what I said already, isn't it? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, of course, something which, you, which, which, which we also should seriously consider, which is also discussed, by the way, with, by various authors. Another problem, another way of solving our, but don't tell this to my colleagues of finance, by the way. Another way of solving a debt problem is very simple. Printing money. Printing money. Printing money. 
You, I owe you money, okay. Here you are. This is called quantitative easing. Yeah, okay. So let's do that. And this is seriously discussed along, among, amongst a lot of economists, by the way. Not in this finance sector, by the way. A lot of economists are, are really discussing it. So this is also an element which I would like to at least bring in discussion, and we should seriously consider that. And the banking re uh, regulation, that's a, a very serious problem which we should uh, look much more closely at. OK, it's 8.30 sharp. Thank you. <laughs>